Thank you guys. I've got the concept of d-values pretty well worked out and, and hopefully some math like that will help you to work those out a little bit better. You'll definitely want to go through and, and one thing you realize is the larger the population, the higher the contamination level, the longer it's going to take to disinfect that area or that environment. And so um, one way that you can do that is actually to wash surfaces and or wash foods. And I talked about that last time. I didn't put it in direct context, but remember when I told you when I went to China and they grabbed that slab of meat and they started washing the outside, their purpose was to remove any bacterial contamination that might have been deposited on that meat when um, the organisms were um, being stored in that outside market without refrigeration and, and everything else. So remember, a D-value is what it t the time it takes to kill 90% of a population, and that's going to be under a specific condition. And conditions are important. The conditions of um, the environment, the conditions of what's going on with the surfaces. If there's, Remember, I think we talked about this last time. If there's dirt or grease in that environment, then those things will slow down the processes. Remember, all of these disinfectants contain chemicals. And chemicals are reactive. That's how they kill the organisms. But if the chemicals are reacting with other things in the environment, then the chemicals are going to be inactivated because they've reacted with those other things like dirt, grease, and other bodily fluids. Uh, pH is important. And many times if you lower the pH, they work better. And also temperature. If you raise the temperature, then many of these agents actually work, work much more efficiently. The reason for that will become obvious next week in laboratory. Next week in lab you're going to be doing two stains of organisms that are difficult to stain. One is the spore stain, and the reason the spores are difficult is because they've got those outer layers that make it pretty impervious to, for things to be able to get inside, and so we have to heat those spores up to get the stain to be able to go inside. The other one is the acid fast stain, and remember it's got that waxy layer on the outside of the mycolic acid on those mycobacteria and a few other bacteria. Again, that makes it difficult for the stains to get in. The same thing is true for these disinfectants. Those layers prevent the disinfectants from being able to get down inside of those cells and therefore they don't work as effectively. But if we raise the temperature a little bit, it helps the agent to be able to get into the cell and be more effective. Typically a low pH is more effective as well. I think we maybe have talked about this a little bit too, but one of the things that we really need to consider is the risk. How likely is it that someone's going to get infected? So. We don't have to be super concerned about the desks here, but if you're in a clinical situation, then you would want to be concerned. And, and so we look at instruments that are used in a clinical situation, and we rate them. Critical use instruments are those that are going to be used to puncture tissue. In other words, go below the skin and actually get down into the tissue. Lots of great nutrients there. Bacteria love to get there. Many of them, you already know, can hide in those tissues and be able to grow. Talked about some of the worms and other things. And so... Um, in the case of the medical situation, anything that's going to penetrate body <coughs> tissues, it has to be sterile. It needs to be sterile, more sterile than Lister wiping his scalpel off on his boots. And so that includes um, needles, scalpels, any kind of cannulas that are going to puncture into tissue. Um, those all have to be sterile. And then the second group is called semi-critical instruments. These guys don't have to be sterile because they're coming in contact with mucous membranes. They're not actually penetrating down into tissues. And the mucous membranes have some immunity. They protect the, the um, individual a bit. And, but they should be free of viruses. And they should be free of vegetative bacteria. But um, endospores have difficulty getting through that mucous membrane. Um, but some vir viruses and bacteria are able to do that. So um, some examples of this are things like the endoscopy um, and other types of devices that are um, introduced into openings in our body that are normally exposed to the atmosphere in one way or another. And then there are critical or non-critical instruments, and those are things like countertops, stethoscopes, blood pressure cuffs. So uh, probably all of you have been in a clinic and you've noticed it's just started happening in the last two or three years where the nurse will actually take a, a wipe, an alcohol wipe, and, and wipe the stethoscope before she goes to listen to your heart. And part of that is about concern of transmission of diseases. Uh, and so you're going to see more and more of that. Those are non-critical. They're not penetrating, not coming in contact with mucous membranes, but still we want to make sure they're reasonably low load with bacterial contamination. Another thing that's important is the composition of the item. 
depending on what you're sterilizing, you can use different approaches. And some things are very sensitive to heat. Many plastics will warp or bend or um, be destroyed by heat, so we can't obviously use heat for those. In the laboratory, making media, there's a number of types of media that you'll play with. One of them you'll play with in a couple of weeks is called OF glucose, and the important part here is that it has glucose in it, or dextrose, through the same chemical. Glucose is very, very sensitive to heat, and you guys have all made rock candy or caramel apples or something like that, and you know when you heat sugars, they tend to caramelize, they tend to turn brown, and what that is is it means the glucose is falling apart and it's starting to be carbonized or turned to carbon dioxide, and it makes those things turn a little bit yellow when you do that. And once you do that to glucose, all of the energy has been released from the glucose. So if you want to make a media that has glucose or some of the amino acids or some other important growth factors, it's going to be, those are mostly heat labile, meaning they'll break down in heat. So you have to sterilize them some other way instead of sterilizing them with a normal heat process. In the laboratory, for most things, though, we're going to use moist heat. We'll throw them in an autoclave, and that's very good for most liquid um, things. We also can use some, um, if heat doesn't work, then we can use liquid chemical disinfectants. But um, there's some things that are moisture sensitive. In other words, if they get exposed to moisture, they're actually going to rust or they'll corrode in some way. And so some things we can't allow to come in contact with moisture, and then we have to use other approaches um, to disinfect those guys. So heat treatment is pretty useful. It's the, really the easiest way, and you guys have already done it in laboratory. Remember what you did in lab when you wanted to sterilize something? What was that you were needing to sterilize in the laboratory? Your inoculation loop, right? You... You use the Bunsen burner to sterilize that, and it worked pretty effectively to, to sterilize that. And so it's uh, pretty good. If, if As long as the material is not going to be destroyed by the heat, then it, it's a reasonable uh, thing. It's usually reliable. It's pretty safe as long as you're careful. It's fast. It's inexpensive. And there's little toxicity to the process of using that. <coughs> um, so we use dry heat in the lab to sterilize those loops. But sometimes we combine heat with moisture, and it actually works much more effectively. And you can use lower temperatures to sterilize when you use moist heat. So moist heat basically uh, denatures proteins. When you use the Bunsen burner, you actually burned up the proteins and everything else that was in those cells. And so um, a different process. But moist heat doesn't get that hot, and it basically causes those proteins to denature. Remember when we were looking at the growth curves for the mesophiles and the thermophiles and, and how the growth curve went up pretty kind of even, and then all of a sudden it dropped off really fast on all of those, and we talked about the reason it drops off so quickly is because the proteins are denaturing. And once they're denatured, they're no longer functional. Well, that's what this moist heat does, too. It denatures those proteins, and then it, those organisms essentially die. So um, we can do boiling, and some of you have done that at home, and that will destroy, destroy a lot of microorganisms and viruses. It uh, may not sterilize. Remember that? Because if there are endospores in that material that you're boiling, they likely won't be killed by that boiling process. Another one that you're familiar with is pasteurization. We talked a little bit about this before. It has to destroy all of the pathogens. But remember, there are some agents in there that cause spoilage that won't be removed, won't be destroyed. There's a couple ways to pasteurize. And if we talk about milk here, one of the ways to do it is called high temperature, short time. And in the U.S., that's the way that we usually do pasteurization is this high temperature short time, or HTST. The reason for that is in the U.S. we drink a lot of milk. And so the dairy industry wants to get a lot of volume through their system very quickly. So they raise it up to a pretty high temperature. It only has to be there a short time. And for milk, for example, in this process, 72 degrees centigrade, just a little bit hotter than the hot water that's in, coming out of your hot water heater. And then 15 seconds is enough to pasteurize that milk gets rid of all those coliforms, all the de disease-causing agents. There'll still be some bacteria down inside of there. But check this out. Think back to D-values. And look at this number right here. If you are doing ice cream, it takes a higher temperature and it takes longer time. Why do you think that might be? 
if there's a good high content of lipids in ice cream, that's one thing to consider. If there's a higher concentration of lipids in ice cream, what's there a lower concentration of? In milk, what's the main liquid in milk? Water. water. So in ice cream, there's a lower concentration of water. We already talked about how water is reactive. Now you've got a lower concentration of water, and the heat makes those water molecules reactive, and now there's less water, so it takes a higher temperature, and it takes more time to be able to get the same effect on the ice cream. So there's a, another pasteur, pasteurization process that's called... Um, low temperature, long time, and it requires, a, they use a lower temperature there, but the milk has to be exposed to that temperature for a, a long time period, a longer time period, and so some places use that, but in the U.S. we typically use that high temperature short time. Uh, some of you may have seen this, ultra high temperature, UHT pasteurization. Have you seen that before? Have you heard of it? How many of you have lived overseas and the in the military or somewhere overseas. Some of you have, right? So if you bought milk overseas, there's a very good chance that it might not have even been in the refrigeration section in the store. Does that sound familiar? And it for sure wasn't in a gallon jug like we got here. America is about the one of the countries that uses gallon jugs. But what did you see when you lived overseas? What kind of milk container did you see when you went to buy milk? It was a plastic container, but pretty much sealed. It was a, a plastic container? Like a waxy container. A waxy yeah. container. Uh, all wax, I paper know, on the was, outside? Almost like a, like a carbon. And okay. And the way I saw it was like a triangular shape. Huh. But there was no um, opening. You had to cut off the, um, the top of it. Okay. Yeah. So it was, I guess it was sealed in a vacuum container? Beautiful, it was. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> usually they're one liter. Instead of one gallon, so about a, a quarter of the volume. And in most places they call them bricks because they're shaped like a, a rectangular brick. And maybe this will ring some bells. And they actually do seal them under a vacuum. But before they seal them, that cardboard container, and it's got a plastic lining down inside of it, they are going to sterilize the inside of the container. And then they actually treat the milk with this process called ultra-high temperature pasteurization. <coughs> pasteurization there is a misnomer because what does pasteurization say about the contents? There's still some bacteria in there, right? <coughs> this process sterilizes, the, in this case, milk that we're talking about. The milk is sterilized before it's put into this sterile carton and then it's sealed under a vacuum in a sterile environment and it's closed and and so you found that it probably wasn't in the refrigerator section. You may have taken it home and put it in your refrigerator. But where, it was out at room temperature, right? Correct. Did you notice the expiration date on it? How long could you keep that milk? Years. Yeah, usually they put a six-month expiration date on it. But when we lived in Switzerland, uh, it was the only kind of milk that we could get. We, whenever it was on sale, Switzerland's really expensive. So whenever it was on sale, we'd buy, like, cases of the milk and put them in the closet and just store them in the closet six months, eight months later, we might have used the last of it that we had bought in that time, and it was still fine. And out of the hundreds and hundreds, I had two kids at that point that drank lots of milk, and I like milk too. Out of the hundreds and hundreds we bought, we only got one that ever went bad. And it was re real easy to tell because they're, they're vacuum sealed, and so the sides of the container are a concave in. And this one had somebody in it that started growing and making gas, so it ballooned up like a balloon, and it was really easy to identify the one that wasn't sterile anymore, to, to not drink it anymore. That's pretty cool. A couple semesters ago, I had a guy who was a helicopter pilot in the military, and he told me that uh, um, he would just grab one every morning and throw it on the dashboard of his helicopter, and then when he got thirsty, he'd rip it open, and he'd have a, a nice drink of warm milk there in the middle of, I think he was in Afghanistan. And um, so he, he said that that was really good, that normal milk would have soured by the time he was ready to drink it at the end of the day, but because this was sterile, um, it, was, it was good. So I asked my dad. My dad worked in the dairy industry. He was in management in the dairy industry for all of his life um, until he opened up his own company. And I asked him, why don't we do this in America? Because you waste so much milk, so much less milk 
than you do with the gallon jugs. Most of you probably had that experience where you went and got a sip, it was sour, so you chug, chug, chug down the drain. And so I asked him, why don't we do that? We would waste so much less milk. And he said they did a study, and Americans thought it didn't taste as good as the other milk. Those of you that have lived in those places, you know that there is a little bit different taste, but after you've drank it for a couple of weeks, it starts taking, tasting pretty normal again at that point. And if you drink it cold, to me, it tastes pretty much the same, but um, some Americans say it tastes burned, so, uh, because they do use a much higher temperature. That's the ultra-high temperature part of it, and, and yet it's, it lasts for quite a bit longer, and you don't need to have refrigeration to keep it to last. I know there's differentiation. Uh, sorry, but uh, uh -huh. between lactose free milk, uh -huh. um, is the processing different? Because I know that we can keep ours for, I mean, the expiration date's pretty, it's like, you know, check the milk that out. you have. Check the milk that you have, and I bet you on the labels of what you're getting is somewhere something that says UHT on it. And it's going to be pasteurized this way. And again, pasteurization is a misnomer because this stuff is sterile, and pasteurization <laughs> means that there's still bacteria down inside of it. So I, I, I asked my dad, but I didn't want to pressure too much, and I said, well, uh, you do milk in this high temperature, short time pasteurization, it spoils, but you do whipping cream that costs a lot more money, and you use the UHT pasteurization process on the whipping cream to make it sterile. And, and are you sure that it's not that you want people to waste milk and buy more milk? But if the whipping cream goes bad on the shelf in 10 days, then you actually lose money. The company actually loses money. And so you want the whipping cream to be able, it sells much more slowly. You want it to be able to stay on the shelf for a longer time period. Two, three, four months of it staying on the shelf will actually save the company money. But if the milk spoils fast, then it makes the company money. And he didn't like that conspiracy theory, but um, I still think that's part of the reason that we sell milk the way we do. Maybe Americans do think it tastes a little bit different. Um, so, but yeah, you can you can do milk with UHT in just a few seconds at 140 degrees centigrade um, is going to sterilize that milk. So let's think about that. Wait a second, 140 degrees centigrade. Where does water boil? 100 degrees centigrade. How can you get milk up to 140 degrees centigrade? Under pressure. You have to put it under pressure. You guys have done that before. Your grandma, remember, she made <coughs> that beautiful pot roast. She put it down inside of this device and maybe put some carrots down inside of there. She put a little bit of water down inside and then she screwed a lid on. She plugged it in and pretty soon it started whistling a little bit as some of the steam was trying to come out from this little pipe that had a weight sitting on top. And as she put it in there, and that pot roast was done in just a couple, three hours, and it tasted delicious. Do you remember that? What's that device called? Pressure cooker. Pressure cooker. That's good. A lot of students call it a crock pot, and that's not it. Um, so <laughs> a pressure cooker, it raises the temperature far above the normal temperature where water would boil because of the pressure down inside, and therefore you can get the contents up higher, they get hotter, the pressure actually makes the steam go into the meat, and it makes it deliciously tender and juicy, and I'm getting hungry already. Um, and so you can do the same thing with the milk, and then they very, very quickly cool it and then package it in those sterile containers, and it will literally sit there. I bet you it would sit there for years. I just never had the experiment to do that. So, so we can use something like your grandma's pressure cooker, in the laboratory, and that's what this guy is right here, um, is really a big pressure cooker. Haven't tried to cook pot roast in it, and if it wasn't so gunky on the inside, I'm sure it would taste fine after we got done. But this device is called an autoclave, and we've got one up in the lab. You should pop in back sometime and look at it. I'll show you how it runs, but they're all a little bit different. Ours works just like your grandmother's pressure cooker. And we put some water down in the bottom of the autoclave. There's a heating element there that heats up the water, causes it to start to boil, and the door is closed and the door is sealed, nothing can escape. So as the water heats up, starts to boil, it makes pressure. As it makes pressure, the water doesn't boil, it just gets hotter and it makes more pressure and it continues to make more and more pressure as the heating element is heating the water up. And ours gets up to about 250 degrees centigrade, 
and that's about 121, uh, sorry, ours gets up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, about 121 degrees centigrade, and ours runs at right around 15 PSI as well. If you're just doing glassware, 15 minutes is plenty to sterilize, but if you're doing a volume of solution, you have to run it a little bit longer, because remember that whole volume has to heat up to that temperature, and that takes some time. So for 500 milliliters, we usually run it for um, 25 minutes just to make sure that it's sterile. And so if you run larger volumes than that, you would have to run it for a longer period of time. There are some devices that are called flash sterilizers. They use a higher temperature. They go faster. There's a little bit of research out there that says that, remember, prions are hard to control, hard to identify. There's some research that says that if we take them all the way up to 132 degrees centigrade for an hour for a really long time, that we might be able to destroy some of those guys. But in most things, we can't actually do that. At least, though, if you're worried about prion diseases, remember... Remember those guys? Does that sound like a dog? It's a bad imitation if it sounds like a dog. Mad cow. Mad cow disease, yeah. So if you're worried about prion disease, then um, uh, what kind of milk would you want to drink? <laughs> Almond milk. Almond milk. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's good. Uh, you might want to go for this UHT milk because look at what's going on there. They use super high temperature. Hopefully that's going to denature any prion proteins that are in the milk that you're drinking and and you should be good for that. The temperature is higher, higher than 132 degrees, but the exposure time is relatively short, so we'll see what it does to it. Yeah? So there's a, little, there's a legitimate threat for these prions that, are, that cause mad cow to get into milk instead of just meat because they are like nervous tissue. There's all kinds of nervous tissue around the tissue that produces milk, and I'm not sure that there's been a lot of research to look at that because... That would ruin the dairy industry if they found out that it was there. So, and then you'd want to drink your, what kind of milk? Almond milk? Yeah, I like almond milk. Soy milk is okay. Um, there's some alternatives out there, but pretty soon we'll figure out that almonds and soybeans have prions too, and then, um, then we'll all be in trouble. Yeah, I think just uh, take the God's word that says eat or drink whatever is put before you, and he'll protect you as long as he wants to, and life will be good. <clears throat> um, so we can use heat um, in commercial canning they do use heat they actually use an industrial size autoclave it's called a retort and they basically put the cans through this device there's high pressure in there there's steam in there and they do a process that is called a 12D process basically it's designed to kill 10 to the 12th endospores in that process that's a lot of endospores. You're going to see when you do the spore stain next week that it's hard to get 10 to the 12th endospores in any particular material. But the concern is there might be endospores down inside of that food that's going to be canned, and if they should germinate, then they will begin to produce um, the botulism toxin, and then that toxin is actually very deadly, and if you eat it, most of the things we're worried about are fruits, vegetables, other things that aren't typically cooked well and heated well that could cause disease and um, jump out of the can and get you. Um, so if you go that high, it's, it's theoretically impossible to have surviving endospores down inside of that material. Did I see a hand go up just a second? Okay, good. So um, when we can food, they're usually not sterile but they're close, and so we call them commercially sterile. Remember, there might be some endospores down inside of there still, but the number's going to be um, pretty close to zero. And so usually it's not a concern, and most of the guys that might be in there only grow well at uh, um, normal storage temperature, so we might um, refrigerate some of those. But remember those weak acids? We put a lot of those weak acids in there, and those are put in intentionally so that if some of those spores that might have survived germinate, they won't be able to grow down inside of that mildly acidic environment. So we can use dry heat, but it's, it's less effective than moist heat. It takes longer times, takes higher temperatures. You guys did that. 
Um, I've got a dry oven in, back in the prep room. I don't use it a lot for sterilization, but if I did, I'd have to take it up to a hundred or 200 degrees centigrade, pretty hot, and it takes quite a bit of time. There's just a few things that I use that for to, to sterilize. Um, and then the moist heat can do the same thing if you can apply it in 15 minutes at 120, 121 degrees centigrade. And so the way that a dry heat works is by oxidizing the components of the cells, basically converting them to CO2 or carbon, and, and then it also denatures proteins, but most of them are going to be um, completely oxidized at those temperatures. We use incineration. That's what we actually did yesterday or when you were in lab, um, and that oxidizes the cell all the way to ash. Uh, in the hospital situation, they don't typically sterilize things with an autoclave. They could, and they will have an autoclave for some things that they need to deal with, but typically in the hospital situation, they have a big incinerator, and all the sp patient specimens that they need to sterilize, they just throw into the incinerator. They don't have to, though, but the main reason they do is because of HIPAA Privacy Act. If you autoclave, many of the labels are still going to have patient record numbers and other things that people could get access to. And people actually started digging through the trash from hospitals and getting information about celebrities and things and, uh, a number of years ago. And so they said, we got to protect everybody. This is... The government said you need to protect everybody's medical records. So they actually put them through the incinerators. It melts down the glass. It burns up plastic containers. It burns up the label completely. So, And I'll, obviously I'll, everything inside is incinerated. So it protects the patient's records and it, it kills any um, organisms that might be down inside of that material. We talked about sterile filter filterization. Remember when we were talking about counting organisms, we had that filter that had pores that was small enough to trap organisms so they couldn't go through. Another way to, to filter sterilized liquids is to do the same thing. All the bacteria are trapped on the top. The liquid that comes through is sterile. And so the liquid that comes through then can be used. And that, Remember glucose, heat sensitive, can't use heat. So if you want to make a glucose solution, the, the way you should do it is to make the solution, pass it through one of these filters, and then um, it'll be sterilized. You can add it back to that media after it's cooled. Um, sometimes we use filters with very small pores. These guys are thin, but one thing about it is you can almost tell it in this picture right here is they tend to clog easily. And um, so if you're trying to get a good volume through there, then they're going to clog before you get that volume to pass through. So sometimes we'll use depth filters. And those are thicker filters. They're much more porous, and so the bacteria actually get trapped in that porous material and can't make it through. They have larger pores, and typically they're electrically charged, so the cells are attracted and bound to it. Sometimes you'll put one of those on top of a membrane filter to trap the larger particulate in the bacteria before it actually gets down to this small pore area and begins to clog that. How many of you have a HEPA filter in your home someplace? How many of you have a vacuum that you bought within the last year? Almost every vacuum out there has a HEPA filter that's purifying the air uh, before it goes back out. And, and basically they have filters that have very small pore sizes. It's not quite 0 0.2. Usually they're about 0 0.45 when we're filtering air. And that's still small enough to trap bacteria from being able to go through. And so I don't know if you knew what HEPA meant, but it means high efficiency particulate air filter. And so that's what those are. And we use them in a lot of different places. You may have the opportunity to work in a surgical suite where the air is actually sterilized by passing it through a HEPA filter. They'll have positive pressure. The air is coming into that room at a high volume and it actually is pushed out through some vents and so the air is tried to maintain sterile um, in those environments. But it's pretty expensive setup so most surgical suites don't have that. They just use positive airflow to keep things from coming back through. Um, but HEPA filters work in kind of the same way. You'll see them possibly in those surgical suites. You may see them um, in the laboratory. Some of you have come into the back room when I'm prepping, and you've seen me working in that kind of silver cabinet thing. It actually has HEPA filters up at the top. 
And so it circulates the air within the cabinet. All the air comes through that HEPA filter, so all the air in the cabinet is sterile except for when I'm reaching in there. And it takes the air out of the main chamber, sucks it back in and back through the HEPA filter, so it continues to recycle the sterilized air in that cabinet. So that's one way to do it. If you're working with viruses, or an infectious agent that might hurt you, you want to use a, a closed cabinet like that. There's a glass sash that pulls down in front. In the department, we have another cabinet that works with a HEPA filter, but that one, the HEPA filter is on the front wall. The air is blowing toward you, and it's sterile air unless you aerosol a bacterium or a virus or something like that. That one's not so good at protecting the worker, but it protects the material that you're working with from getting contaminated. So. We use that kind of hood for setting up polymerase chain reactions and other things because it's blowing all the contaminants that might fall into the tubes away from the tubes and keeping the tubes and the media and other things sterile, but it's blowing them toward the, the worker in that case. And so not quite as safe for protecting the worker, but they protect, they protect the materials that you're working with. Okay. So another way that we can sterilize things is through radiation. And this is the close to full spectrum of, of visible light plus the UV that's right there. They've expanded that out from the spectrum that's down below right here and you can see a number of different types of wavelengths that you're familiar with. Most of you have machines in your home that produce these types of rays, those microwaves, and how do they work again? I think we've talked about it, but how do microwaves heat things up? They make the water molecules move and oscillate and make molecular friction, and that friction actually creates heat, and so that's the way they work, and they have just enough energy to be able to get those molecules to mo oscillate and move and create that friction. The further we go to the right on this scale, the lower the energy those waveforms have. The inverse is true as well. The further we go out to the left on this scale, the higher the energy those waveforms have. And you probably already knew that. X-rays can nicely pass through your skin and your bone, and at least some of them, and then show up on an X-ray film on the other side. And so they've got relatively high energy, and you guys know gamma rays, right? There's a famous superhero that was the Incredible Hulk was hit by gamma rays, remember that? And he got all that energy from the gamma rays, and so he's a superhero now. Mm -hmm. And so they obviously have a lot of energy, and gamma rays are great for sterilization. We use them um, in a lot of commercial processes. Many of the, the things that when you get over to the nursing side and you start working with devices that have been sterilized, they're usually sealed in plastic wraps, and then one side's usually clear, those are usually gamma radiated because the gamma rays can pass through those materials and sterilize by killing any organisms. They hit the DNA from the organisms, they break the DNA, and they do that enough that the organisms die. But even visible light has some energy. Your grandma probably knew that. My grandma used to put the blankets at the end of the winter. She put them out on the clothesline to air them out, but she only did it on sunny days because she knew that the UV from the sunlight was actually going to kill any organisms that were out on the surface of those. And remember, as we go from right to left in this scale, we're getting higher energy. And you knew that too because you want to protect your eyes from UV light because it can cause damage. It causes damage to DNA and it can cause cataracts in our eyes, and so it's got more energy than the visible light, so we try to protect our eyes from that level of energy so we don't get damage. And UV is also very, very effective at killing microorganisms. But UV light, compared to some of these rays, gamma rays and X-rays, has low energy level, right? <coughs> Based on that scale, it's to the right of those guys, so it has lower energy level. And um, so UV light can kill, but it doesn't penetrate very well. It can really only penetrate through a millimeter or less of water, and so it doesn't, um, it's not able to get through if there's contamination on the surface um, to kill those bacterial cells. We'll talk about how the killing mechanisms for it down the road, but basically it energizes some of the chemicals in DNA and causes them to react together with each other. The other thing that you need to notice from this slide is that, remember, we've got increased energy going this way, but if you look at the wavelengths, the wavelengths are increased going this way. So the energy of a, a radiation particle is inversely proportional to its wavelength. The longer the wavelength, the less energy it's going to have. The shorter the wavelength, the more energy it's going to have. 
Everybody good with that? Okay. So then the more energy it has, the more likely it is to be able to damage biological materials. So ionizing radiation. Um, now we're talking about gamma rays, beta rays in this case. And they can destroy DNA. They can damage cytoplasmic membranes. They can react with oxygen to produce those reactive oxygen species that we've talked about. Specifically, X-rays and gamma rays, we use those to sterilize a lot of heat-sensitive materials um, done after packing. Um, now, I, I think I told you earlier that the FDA has actually said we can use that for things like vegetables that don't normally get cooked, lettuce, cantaloupes, other things we can sterilize with gamma radiation to reduce the amount of um, pathogens. And they're also starting to look at uh, meats that might have those worms and other parasites in them that we talked about, and so we can use that for those as well. Some students are concerned that if we use radiation to sterilize, it means that the food is then radioactive. All of these particles have so much energy that they pass all the way through the food, don't deposit anything except for a little bit of energy wherever they hit those molecules. They break the molecules, they break the DNA, they break proteins and denature proteins, but it doesn't make those molecules radioactive when it, when it does that. So um, should be safe to eat. Your body's going to break those molecules as soon as you eat them anyway. As soon as your body gets DNA and RNA and protein in, it gets hydrolyzed and it's broken down into monomers again. Um, so it shouldn't be any problem. Yes, sir? I used to have an ionizer in my house. Is that like these ionizers? Radiation. Yeah, that's not doing that, but what it does is most of the particles in the air have some sort of charge, and the ionizer is going to have a, usually a negative charge, and it attracts those particles, so it pulls them out, and, and usually it's dealing with gases um, in, the, in the air, mostly, and pulling those out and reacting with those to remove those from our environment. Some of you may have started the class as germaphobes. I hope you're not still, but if you are, you can actually go to eBay. You should probably do this because you can get some pretty cool stuff. They actually sell some wands on eBay that have a, a fluorescent UV light on it. It must be pretty low-level UV, but you can get these wands so you can go over all the surfaces in your home and make sure that all those surfaces are bacterial-free. And you can go check that out. There's all kinds of devices that are, people are making out there. Um, do what? Uh, which will? Oh, you'll find it so you can see where it is so you know to clean it up. Good answer. I hadn't gone there in my mind, but thanks. Um, so UV radiation is, is pretty good on surfaces, but it, it actually doesn't penetrate through many plastics and some glass and, and other things because it's relatively weak. Um, but we can use it to destroy microbes in the air and the water. Inside of that cabinet that I was just talking to you about up in the lab, that stainless steel cabinet, when I close the sash, I can flip a switch and it turns on a UV light. And that will sterilize all the surfaces down, down inside of there. But even if you've got a, a thin coating over it, it will reduce the effectiveness of, of the UV light of penetrating. You already knew that because they can theoretically dip your glasses into a material and then it'll be coated with something that protects your eyes from UV light. In reality, most plastic that's as thick as glasses absorbs UV anyway, and so it, it's a little bit of a gimmick, but um, most plastic, most glass is going to absorb UV light. Um, so if you've got organisms that are in solid materials or turbid liquids, it won't be as effective as at killing those organisms. Uh, microwaves we already talked about generate heat, not directly though. They make those um, water molecules move, so they don't kill directly either. The food actually heats unevenly. Some cells might survive, so don't just throw your contaminated steak in the microwave thinking you'll kill those bacteria. Probably won't do it. We actually talked about making guacamole. Did any of you guys enjoy a nice Mexican food after that last time? Yes, good. So. Yeah, they, they can use high PSIs now. Did anybody, none of you went and ran over your foot, right? <laughs> yeah, good. All right, that's good. So, but anyway, it's pretty effective at killing microorganisms. Um, and as that pressure is exposed to the microorganisms, it does a number of things. It denatures their proteins. It messes up the cell membrane. And uh, one of the things that is good about this is when you use the pressure on some foods, you maintain the color and the flavor doesn't get destroyed. So it gives us a pretty natural flavor. And if you're going to make guacamole, you've got to apply some kind of pressure anyway. 
So when we look at chemicals, we usually rate them based on their level of efficiency. And some chemicals can actually destroy all the microorganisms that are on a surface. And those guys we call sterilants. And we use those when we've got something that's heat sensitive or we can't put it into an autoclave, something that's too large to autoclave. And so those are, are good if they don't damage the material that we're using them on. And then there are others that have, we call them high level disinfectants. These guys can destroy viruses. Um, they can kill vegetative cells. They don't usually kill endospores. And we're going to use these guys on semi-critical instruments. Things, what's a semi-critical instrument? Do you remember the definition? Just Contact talked about it. Mucous Contact mucous membranes, but they don't do what? Penetrate. They don't penetrate down inside of the tissues. Good. So these, these devices, again, don't have to be sterile, but they should be pretty much free of any pathogenic organisms. Okay, and then we've got intermediate disinfectants. They destroy vegetative bacteria. Um, these guys can hit mycobacteria. Remember why it's hard to hit? It's got that mycolic acid out in the cell wall. Fungi tend to be a little bit more challenging to hit. Some of their spores are difficult to kill. Most viruses are killed by these guys. And then even below that, this is pretty much what you can get at Walmart is low-level disinfectants. The destroy fungi, vegetative bacteria, can't hit mycobacteria, and it can't hit the envelope viruses. I didn't point it out. I already erased it, but, oh, sorry, it can't hit the non-envelope viruses, the naked ones. All these viruses that we hit have a membrane on the outside. They're easy to kill compared to the naked viruses. And so they're only, all, both of those agents are only killing envelope viruses, and they aren't able to kill very easily without very extended exposures, those naked viruses that might be there. We use these guys to disinfect for floors, cabinets, countertops, those kind of things. Uh, one thing you need to know is that you can make some things that are high-level sterilants or disinfectants. You can make them function as sterilants. How might you do that? Time. You would put them on for a longer time period. Maybe concentration, raise the temperature up. So some of those things that are classified as, as high-level disinfectants can be used as a sterile if you can expose the item to that material for a longer period of time. So the same thing's true. If you take a low-level disinfectant and you increase the time that it, of exposure, obviously they're going to kill more organisms. How do we know that? because you understand the concept of devalues, right? Devalues is the time of exposure. So if you add more devalues, and assuming the chemical has not been broken down by the organism, it should continue to kill at a constant rate over that extended period of time. So when we select a disinfectant or a germicide, we have to consider a number of things. One thing we have to consider is the toxicity of that agent. There's some really great ones that work really fast in milliseconds, but they would literally kill all of us in milliseconds too. And most of the time we think that's not a good idea. So, and the other thing we need to think about is the environment. What's going on there? If there's contamination in the environment, then the activity of some of them is greatly reduced by that contamination in the environment. And then there's compatibility with the material being treated and we use the word corrosive here. Some chemicals work really well at killing organisms, but they're actually corrosive to surfaces. So when you think of corrosion, I imagine you think of an R word, right? Mm -hmm. Do you? Yeah. What's that four-letter word? Yeah. Rust. I don't like to say four-letter words, so thank you. Rust. And, uh, but corrosion doesn't necessarily mean rust. That's just what metal does when it corrodes, but even plastic surfaces can corrode and you begin to get pitting on the surface and when you get pitting on the surface then the material begins to break down more quickly. Sometimes residues are really, really good as long as they're not toxic and they're not corrosive. 
So sometimes there's some of those hand sanitizers that are not hand sanitizers, but hand lotions that actually have some chemicals in them that are antimicrobial, not the triclosan, but other chemicals. Chlorhexidine is one of those. And when you put the hand lotion on your hands, you're putting that chemical on. It's got antimicrobial properties, and it leaves a residue on your hands, and it kills those organisms that you might come in contact along the way. And so sometimes that's not bad, but if that residue does become toxic or corrosive, then it can be a problem. Another one is that we have to consider is cost and availability. That first day or second day when we swab stuff, I asked if anybody had a silver ring. And I wanted to swab a silver ring. I can't remember if we found one in this class or not, did we? Uh, silver has beautiful antimicrobial properties. So does gold. Even copper has beautiful antimicrobial properties. If you're a germaphobe and you become a rich germaphobe, you can go to Austin and you can buy sinks that are made up entirely of copper. And they're beautiful, but they cost five or $6,000. And you can get faucets that are made out of pure copper. And they're beautiful, too. You have to polish them frequently, but people that are germaphobes go and buy them. In fact, the first couple of years that I was here, a company contacted me and said, we're making these. We know that they have antimicrobial properties. We really want somebody to do the testing on them to figure out how effective they are at killing normal organisms. And, and so a lot of companies do that. I sent them off to a company because I didn't really have time to do that research. But they, they want to market those because they're expensive to people who are afraid of germs, but because they work. Those, those metals are toxic to bacteria. <coughs> they kill bacteria. In fact, copper is toxic to you. So, so is silver. There's a disease called Wilson's disease. Have you heard of it? Mm -hmm. President Wilson had it. And basically, in our bodies, we have enzymes that we eat copper all the time and trace amounts in the food that we eat, and our body is able to remove the copper from our circulation. But people that have Wilson's disease are lacking or at least deficient in that enzyme and the copper accumulates and it accumulates in the brain and then it starts shorting out the neurons and they have seizures because of the copper that they've accumulated in their diet from not being able to clear it out of their system. And it's, it's toxic. It messes up with the, the proton motive force that we talked about. It messes with a, a number of other functions in, inside of the cell. Okay. Another thing that we have to consider is the storage and stability. Some of the gases that are out there that are really effective, um, they break down into things that are even more toxic than they are, and many of them are highly flammable or combustible when they break down into some of their byproducts, and, and some of them are just flammable themselves. And so storage can be a problem, and, and stability in the long term can be a problem. Um, but if they're not stable, it also decreases their concentration in that material. And then the other one is environmental risk. What's it going to do to the environment if it gets out? How do we deal with it before we release it into the environment? All of those things have to be considered when you're thinking about microbial, antimicrobial agents. In the lab, we use 70% ethanol to sterilize or at least disinfect our benches. <coughs> it works really, really well. Um, and so alcohols are great for that. You've seen them in the hand sanitizers, too. It used to be when they first came out with hand sanitizers, they had ethyl alcohol or ethanol in them. And then some people said, hey, that's really cheap alcohol. I can just get the alcohol out of there and I can resell it. It was modern day bootlegging. And so they started doing that. They started distilling the alcohol out. And then some kids heard about it and the kids started drinking that stuff just because they could buy hand sanitizers, they weren't restricted at the time. They could go in and get large bottles of hand sanitizer, 70% ethanol, that's higher than pretty much anything you can buy at a liquor store. And so they would go buy the hand sanitizers and enjoy their sanitizer party and drink it. And the government figured that out because they started posting posts on YouTube and stuff. And, and then they said, okay, we can't sell ethanol this way. So they switched to isopropanol thinking that people would just be smart and stop drinking it, but some kids are dumb and they didn't stop drinking it. And when you drink isopropanol, it tends to make you go blind. And so the government said, okay, they're not smart enough to stop drinking it. They're going blind. We can't put the isopropanol in there. So most of the hand sanitizers switch back to putting ethanol in them. And if you look at your bottles today, almost all of them are going to have ethanol down inside. And so if you go to YouTube and look at ethanol party or, or sorry, hand sanitizer party or something like that, you'll find all kinds of videos that silly kids made of themselves drinking hand sanitizer to get that little bit of alcohol buzz that they couldn't buy any other way. I feel like going blind is kind of a random side effect of drinking uh, 
Uh, so uh, all alcohols are toxins, and that one happens to affect the nerves, and it, it damages the nerve of the eye, and so it's not real random. It, it's pretty targeted, and it's a, a pretty frequent. If you drink it more than a few times, it's a pretty frequent occurrence. So don't do the experiment, please. Um, yeah, I didn't think you were probably going to. But alcohols, again, they work. They can kill vegetative cells. They're not so effective against endospores. We're going to play with endospores next week in the lab. I'm not really worried about those guys getting loose. The numbers that you have are relatively few, and the organism that we use isn't really, it's not a pathogen. It doesn't even like to grow in your body. So, um, so and ethanol will kill some naked viruses, not all of them. It works by coagulating proteins like enzymes and other things. <laughs> We actually make it 70%. Some people say, well, if 70% works, works well, why don't you use 100%? One, it's hard to get 100% alcohol. But you probably noticed when you were doing the gram stain this week, when, that was ethanol acetone. But when you wash the water off or washed it off with water, what did you see? They don't like to mist together. The acetone definitely is hydrophobic, and alcohol is hydrophobic too. So to kill cells, the alcohol has to get inside of the cells to denature those proteins, right? So if you add that 30% or some people add 35% water, it actually helps that to miss with the water of the cells to go into the cells and be able to kill. So 70, 65, 70% actually works better than straight ethanol. It can also damage the membranes. Remember how we talked about in the gram stain, the alcohol strips off the outer membrane of those gram negatives and then it works better. Acetone just works a little bit better at doing that than the alcohol does, so we use it in the gram stain procedure to make sure that those guys stain correctly. Um, so it, remember I told you earlier that you can buy rubbing alcohol, and if you buy, that's isopropanol, and if you look at the label, it's going to say that it's an antiseptic. What's the definition of an antiseptic? You can use it on the skin. So an antiseptic is a disinfectant that can be used on the skin. Everybody's got that, right? Cool. There are some limitations. Remember, we talked about D values, and this is one limitation for this guy is that it evaporates quickly. So you may not have thought about it, and but do you remember the procedure I told you to use on the bench in the laboratory? What, what was the order that I told you to do it in? Spray, Spray the bench, and then do what? Not yet. Spray the bench. Go get a paper towel, come back with a paper towel, spread it around, don't dry the bench, spread it around, go throw the paper towel away, go wash your hands, and then come back. And remember I said it hopefully will still be wet at that point when you come back, but just about dry. And the whole purpose was to give longer D values. Going to get the paper towel adds time that there's exposure. Coming back and spreading around adds time that there's exposure going and throwing the paper towel away. Remember, we don't want to dry the surface. We just want to coat the whole surface with the ethanol. Those were all intentionally designed, and I told you to do it that way, to add more D values so that you would understand this concept when we came to this chapter. So you're adding lots of D values as you're, as you're going to get the paper towel and as you're spreading it out and as you're throwing the paper towel away. That bench should still be pretty saturated. And I've seen some of you going really sparingly and just putting a few squirts on there. Don't do it that way. You're not really getting rid of the bacteria. You should be wetting the surface pretty well and then spreading it out, and all the surface should become wet. So make sure you do that, and that'll give enough D values to kill anybody that somebody that was working there might have left before. Ethanol can destroy some rubbers and plastics and other things like that, but for the environments that we use, um, it's pretty good. The next type or class of germicides are aldehydes, and some of you have seen these. You might have been in a biology lab that had specimens that were fixed with formaldehyde. The mushroom in this class was, so I kept it in a closed container so you weren't exposed to it. In a dentist office and other places where they use equipment that gets exposed to um, uh, fluids from bodies of individuals. They, they use glutaraldehyde to quickly sterilize those, those agents. And, and then there are others that are being developed because these first two are actually pretty toxic and, and they're thought to be mutagens, maybe carcinogens. And so um, uh, others are being developed that can work well. But these guys function by inactivating or denaturing proteins and denaturing nucleic acids. Um, a 2% glutaraldehyde solution is pretty common 
in a number of dentist offices to disinfect or in long exposure sterilize items. Formaldehyde is actually a gas. So when we say formaldehyde solution, it's actually a misnomer, but um, we make a solution that's 37% formaldehyde in water, and then that solution name is formalin. So down the road, when you're working with vaccines, many times we don't want to put the live bug into the vaccine because it might actually cause disease. And so to kill that bug, a lot of times we'll put formaldehyde in the form of formalin in with the bacterium. It kills the bacterium, and then after the bacterium's killed, they'll freeze it down really cold, they'll lyophilize it. Remember the common word for lyophilization? We do it to our coffee. Freeze dry. They'll lyophilize it or they'll freeze dry it. That gets rid of all the formaldehyde gas, gets rid of all the water, and now you've got a vaccine that's still got the proteins from that organism, but the organism's dead, so it won't infect the individual and cause problems. So we can do that um, process. Uh, formaldehyde functions as a great germicide, kills most microbes very, very quickly. Um, that's why we use it as a preservative, because it's down in there. Any more microbes that get down in are unable to grow. They're, they're killed as soon as they get down inside. But because of the toxicity and other problems, a lot of places, including UMHB, are trying to move away from having specimens that are fixed in formaldehyde. Another group are the biguanides. Uh, this is one that you're probably familiar with. We see this guy, chlorhexidine, in a lot of different places. Do you, any of you have not the hand sanitizers, but hand lotion that says it's antibacterial? Do you have little tubes in your purses, ladies, of lotion that says it's antibacterial? This is almost always the one that's put into those hand lotions that say they're antibacterial. And um, it's used in a lot of antiseptics like that. It stays on the skin. It leaves a nice residue. It's non-toxic, and it'll destroy vegetative bacteria. What's the definition of vegetative bacteria? I told you before. I want to make sure you remember. What was it? No. Active growing. So any cells that are going through binary fission, that's vegetative growth. So we call those vegetative bacteria. So the opposite, anything that's not vegetative, the type that you know of would be endospores, right? Endospores, fruiting bodies, those guys that aren't growing actively. These guys kill all those vegetative cells pretty well. Um, we use them in hand creams. Even mouthwash has chlorhexidine in it these days to deal with some of the bacteria that are in there. You can go look for that. I'm sure you'll find it. It's a pretty cool one. Um, and so that's the biguanides. Uh, this is a gas, ethylene oxide. There's a number of gases that are like it. It's a very nice stereolite. One of the things that's nice about gases is that gases can penetrate down into pores and pockets and crevices when even liquids can't. And so it's very good at getting into devices that have very small openings and sterilizing those areas and destroying the bacteria, even endospores that might be there. Ethylene oxide is very reactive. It reacts with proteins. It can penetrate all kinds of stuff and be able to do that. We use it a lot when we need to sterilize something quickly and they're heat sensitive or moisture sensitive. So a number of disposable laboratory items like uh, petri dishes, pipettes are done that way. More and more of those are going to gamma radiation, but ethylene oxide could work. It's one of those that's difficult to use because it's toxic to humans, very, very toxic. The devalue for humans is like two milliseconds. And so it works very effectively on humans. And it also is one that's very flammable, so there's storage issues with it. Um, you have to use it because it is toxic to humans in a chamber that's a lot like an autoclave. You pump the gas in, sterilizes the item, you pump the ba gas back out and collect it again, then you can open up and get your item out. It is mutagenic and it's potentially carcinogenic, so again, you have to use it in a very controlled environment. These guys you know, the halogens. And you know them from swimming pools. That's what we use in the most swimming pools, unless you have a saltwater pool to deal with organisms that might get down inside. They oxidize proteins. They can oxidize other cellular components, too. The one you're probably most familiar with is the chlorine. And that's because you know it from the pool, but you also know hypochlorite from Clorox. Um, we can use these, the chlorine as a disinfectant. It is caustic to the skin and mucous membranes. 
Um, if you take household bleach and dilute it about 1 to 100, then you can use that as a pretty effective solution to kill things around your home. Um, drinking water can be used. We actually put crypt, uh, chlorine in to deal with these guys. And how many of you have ever been... Oh, my, you let me talk too long. You guys are too kind. The clock is fast. All right, I'll go with that. Thanks. You guys have a good day. Hours, I can also um, well, look at that. I thought I